Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Science Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be answering your questions on a range of different topics, including Olympic lifting, rotational power training, squatting, long steady state runs. If you're wanting your question to appear in the next episode of Boxing Science Podcast, leave them in the comment box below. And let's get firing through some of the questions for this week's episode. So receive question, power clean or hand clean for boxing? Is it good? or bad. Really, the power clean is a fantastic tool to improve strength, speed, explosiveness, and that kinetic chain sequencing from lower body through to the upper body. Boxers do struggle with performing the catch during a power clean or of a full clean derivative. Now, the reason why is because of wrist uh, stability and re- wrist flexibility, and also shoulder mobility as well. And this can, in fact, increase the amount of load going through the wrist and the elbow joints. So this can end up uh, being increased likelihood of injury, but also can limit the amount of load that's actually lifted during a clean. Also, the technique is quite difficult to perform. So the technique is developed over years and years of training. Now, if I've got a boxer that's fighting for a British or European title, and they're needing to get fitter, faster and stronger within a 10 week training camp, I'm not gonna spend weeks and weeks uh, using a broomstick or light loaded barbell, teaching them the technique of Olympic lifting. I need to find the quickest and most effective way to improve their speed and power to transfer into an explosive performance. So with Olympic lifting, even though there's a lot of benefits to it, it's not really applicable to a boxing training camp setting. I would do it with a youth athlete to have that tool in the toolbox later on in their career. But if I'm working with a professional athlete, I wouldn't be using full derivatives of the clean. Now, what I would do is use different variations. So using a clean pull, either from the floor or from a block, to just purely work on that kinetic chain sequencing, that rate of force development, that powerful hip extension that can transfer into explosive boxing performance. Also, uh, talking about Olympic lifting, the other tools that I would use is a split jerk, mainly a landmine split jerk. Boxers do struggle with overhead strength and mobility. So using a landmine will get the benefits of a split jerk without compromising that shoulder joint. And you can do this with two hands with a Viking press, or you can do some single arm work as well. So single arm landmine split jerk. So question, what is the average bench press record for a boxer? We don't normally do bench press one met max. Uh, The reason why is quite compromising on the elbow and shoulder joints, especially for boxers that are quite tight around their shoulders. And we don't normally use the the bench press as a key tool. We normally go towards like rack press or we'll do the dumbbells. Uh, As a strength standard, I would say to perform between three and five repetitions between one and 1.1 times of body weight. So for a 65 kilo boxer, like walking around weight, they'd be expected to be doing 32.5 to 40 kilos as like, I'd, I'd say that that's a, that's a strong athlete. For the rack press, that would be a little bit more, let's say going up towards 85 to 100 kilos on the rack press. I'd say that they're pretty strong uh, for the upper body. But yeah, this is, this is all transferable uh, to different different athletes at different ways, different strength types. Are they more of a, a strength athlete compared to a springy and fast and explosive athlete? It all depends. As long as you're increasing their performance, you know, you don't really have to do like strength standards for for, for the upper body. I'd more be more focus on what they've been able to do on lower body and also how they're expressing that into a a punch specific action with the landmine punch throw assessment. So next question, how to fix a good morning fault during a back squat when already assess ankle mobility and it's not an issue? So it's a great question and it's very specific as well. So I'll try and break it down the best way possible. The good morning fault is, uh, for those that don't know, is basically when it's an excessive forward lean during a back squat. And this is often due to, like, like uh, Andreas says on, on the question, ankle mobility, uh, but also hip mobility and core strength. Now we can start working these in isolation. So you can 
work on your core strength, work on your hip flexibility. But we're actually wanting to try and transfer into a particular technique on the back squat. So I'm always a keen believer on training the movement, let the muscles adapt to that. So train the movement and the muscles will follow. What you need to do is do derivatives of the back squat and the squatting exercise to achieve that movement goal. So if you are getting a forward lean on a back squat, I would say to use something like a plate squat to press within your mobility drills. So using a pressing action as you're going down into the squat to use a bit of a counter movement effect. If that weight is increased, like away from the body anteriorly, that will force your body into sitting back onto the heels and sitting in a more upright position. So a squat to press action, uh, sitting deep into that squatting action uh, whilst balancing. So grabbing hold of the squat rack and sitting nice and deep and keeping that chest upright. These are a good preparation exercises to use. And then doing front loaded squats, so doing some, some goblet squats, pausing at the bottom of that, getting used to being in that posture at the bottom of the movement. And then actually, if you're wanting to keep back squats into your program, doing some box squats where you're actually pausing on the box and sitting into a really upright position. Starting this from, let's say, just lower than a half squat position to start off with, and then challenging the depth, further challenging this with a pause squat. So doing light loaded back squats, pausing at the bottom, really sticking that chest up, and then firing through the movement. Using these things, so using the plate squat and press, using the sitting into that deep squat in, uh, next to the squat rack, using it, the squat rack for balance, using this as a warm-up exercise, working back, using the goblet squats and box squats to, uh, as your main compound lift before revisiting the back squat. And you should see some really big improvements in your back squat technique. So I've received a question on YouTube. What do you think about neck bridges? Is it dangerous? Yeah, I say it would be. You put an excessive load in a very compromised position. Whenever we do neck training, we're wanting to keep the neck aligned with the spine. And this is great for neck health and also optimal spine health as well. In neck bridges, you're going into excessive extension of the neck, going back and real compressive forces going through the neck there. And then if you're putting all your body weight through it, it can be in fact quite dangerous to do. With our training, we're wanting to make sure that that neck's aligned with the spine using some band resistance, going for more extensive repetitions, somewhere between 20 and 40 seconds, then leading towards more maximal uh, contractions between three and five seconds, getting a partner to create that resistance or getting your coach to create that resistance and you to maintain that neck alignment. And then challenge that in different movement planes. Uh, so we'll do lateral neck holds, and we'll do anterior and posterior neck holds as well. Okay, so I've got a good question here. I'd like to say that I have decent rotational power, but lacking in rotational speed, especially when throwing a jab and a lead hook. Any ways to improve this while maintaining good power? I would say that this is a very specific scenario. If you're working on a jab and a, and a lead hook, it's all about kind of that, that timing and speed element. In a strength conditioning setting, if somebody's struggling with rotational speed, would be looking to do like light loaded medicine ball throws. So from a kneeling position with a three kilo med ball, overloading that rotational element, catch and throw technique. And then also like doing some sort of like over speed training as well. So doing some lateral shuffles into med ball, rotational med ball throw, karaoke's into rotational med ball throw. And this can have a big transfer into your rot rotational speed and power. Um, hopefully that helps. You might be working on these already and it might be more of a technical element to work with your, with your boxing coach. But yeah, that's probably what I'd, I'd be working on. Um, you can also work on some banded rotations, some repeated rotations and really work on that speed element as well. So hopefully that helps and uh, let us know whether you use them exercises. So I've got a question here, something that we get a lot about long steady state runs and everything, but this is particular with distance. Is running 10 miles good for conditioning for boxing? A black and white answer to this is no. I would not advise boxers to do 10 mile runs. I would advise them to do low intensity runs for active recovery, but doing a 10 mile run excessive 
it's out on the road, it's not replicating the demands of the sport, it can end up being in that no man's land setting where it's like between 80 and 90% of the maximum heart rate, basically aren't getting the fitness demands that they need for, the, for, for boxing, but also not working in that recovery zone, that aerobic zone, that's gonna be effective for active recovery. With running out a 10 mile run, the, the running speed isn't great. So the running technique won't be great and you're just creating high impact forces, a lot of wear and tear on the lower extremity and also not replicating the, the high speed and high intensity nature of boxing. So our conditioning drills are either high intensity, whether that's a red zone conditioning or repeated sprint ability or doing our 30 second max out sprints. But for the active recovery runs, we actually start breaking this up into tempo runs. So we can do like a session which consists of a range of different intervals from four minutes, two minutes, one minute and 30 second intervals, but all working in that green zone. So between 70 and 80% of their maximum heart rate. And then actually we'll do some tempo runs as well, which consists of 15 second uh, runs with 45 second break. We'll do between six and eight repetitions. We'll have two minutes rest and then we'll do that for three or four sets. Now, what we've actually done with that is calculate the estimated distance that they'll cover during a tempo run. And we compared that with what they'd probably do if they was just going out for a, a steady 30 minute run. We've worked out that boxers will probably cover between six and seven kilometers within 30 or 40 minutes, working with, within that green zone, the target zone for active recovery. But during the tempo runs, they actually get the same amount of time within that green zone, but they're only covering one kilometer or 1.5 kilometers. Really, you're getting a lot more kind of for, for your running gait and you're getting more efficient for that 30 minutes runs. So less distance covered, less amount of steps, less wear and tear of the body, but you're actually targeting the same fitness adaptation. And that's the key goal of active recovery. You're burning the calories, you're getting the fitness adaptations, but you're being really efficient with it. If you're looking to keep in some longer form conditioning, some aerobic style conditioning, I would definitely go towards active recovery runs. And the link is in the description if you're wanting to find out more about how these active recovery runs are actually implemented at Boxing Science. Okay, guys, so that brings us to the end of this episode of Boxing Science Podcast. Thank you very much for your questions. If you're wanting to your questions answered in the next episode, please leave them in the comment box below. Make sure that you're subscribed to the Boxing Science YouTube channel and the podcast channel to make sure that you don't miss out on any future content. Thank you very much for watching or listening. I hopefully see you on the next episode.